And I will say welcome. My name is Dawn Salerno. I'm coming to you from the Roach Jones Duff House and Garden Museum. We are hosting tonight's lecture with Dr. Paul Raymond. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I guess you're really there. Thank you for being there, but for tuning in <laughs> to us to hear this talk. We've actually been doing virtual talks like this since fall uh, of 2020. And uh, given our lovely garden that we have, we'll be starting some outdoor programming as soon as May this year. I'm going to put our link to our calendar in, our, in the chat for you so that you can see what we have coming up. As soon as even next week, we have, um, we have another Dr. Raymond giving a lecture next week. Uh, and, um, and the link will take you to more information about that. So thank you all for being here. Um, I do wanna mention that tonight's presentation is part of AHA New Bedford, and that is a citywide um, event. There are many programs going on tonight. I will put that link in the chat. Many of them are virtual, so you can join them after you leave this lecture. If you're up for a, a night, a night on the, or inside, I guess, a night on the town is really a night at your computer. Um, I'll put that link in the chat. And um, lastly, I'd just like to thank you for being here. We um, are, will gladly accept any donations to tonight's event. It is a free event. We've been giving a lot of our virtual programming um, for, for free this whole year. So um, if you'd like to make a donation to the RJD, it goes right back into programming like this. I will put that link in the chat for you. So with that, let's get to the exciting stuff. Dr. Paul Raymond. Um, Dr. <laughs> I'm going to give you a short intro and then it's all you. Um, so actually, Paul, um, as we know him and call him here, is a volunteer in our own rose garden. The RJD has a parterre rose garden um, that, uh, historic, that is historic to the house. And we have both our, I do want to give a shout out to our own Rick Finneran, who's head of buildings and grounds and, and is the caretaker of the garden here. Um, and he works with Paul out there who's nicely volunteered his time and talents to us. So uh, Dr. Raymond has been growing roses for over 10 years and he is a certified consulting rosarian of the American Rose Society. So I'm going to let him take it from here. And I know Paul, you wanna share some slides. Okay. Hi, uh, welcome again to the uh, uh, First, my first, uh, I can't get rid of this thing up top here. Oh, I, okay. I think if you play the show, it'll there all go, go away. All right. There you go. Thank you. Uh, anyway, this is my first attempt at public speaking for, uh, on this topic of uh, growing roses. So you have to bear with me. I'm going to be a little nervous, and but uh, hopefully uh, it'll come off, and you'll uh, we'll all get to learn a few things. I invite you to ask me questions at the end, and uh, uh, but uh, really, growing roses organically is not that much different from uh, growing roses inorganically. But I don't even know if you can do that. But by organically, I mean we don't use pesticides. We don't use fungicides uh, and we don't use herbicides on a, a routine basis. We do, okay, with some of the uh, processes that we do, uh, do, do affect the insects and so forth, but they're minimal and I'll explain that as we go. Oh boy. Uh, what the heck? My. Uh, Try your arrow down or arrow. It's not advanced. neither one. Nothing's working here. Oh, there we go. Okay. The first thing you want to do is uh, select roses that are hardy. Uh, most of the, I don't know. Are you seeing my full screen or is this pot being blocked out? That's no, we're seeing. It's perfect, Paul. We see the whole okay. screen and the whole slide. All right. Uh, the uh, what you want to do when you uh, and the most important thing when you uh, planting or uh, growing roses is to select hardy roses, roses that are going to survive more than one or two years. The newer roses are all pretty much in this category. By that, I mean roses that have been developed in the last 15 or 20 years are, uh, are pretty much uh, very uh, hardy. Uh, and the reason being that knockouts came out. 
knockouts were de developed by uh, 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 William Radler and William. Uh, they were they took the rose growing industry by storm. They're easy to grow, they're beautiful, and they are very disease resistant. Uh, the other rose growers, the other developers, found out that uh, you know they were being sidelined, and uh, before they were growing roses for different uh, shapes and colors and so forth. And uh, the rose fancy is like that, but the general population uh, wants hardy roses. They don't want to be planting roses or having to spray roses all the time. So the knockout roses change everything. The selection criteria that uh, you might want to use is, uh, first of all, hardiness, that they able to, to survive in the climate. Color uh, that you like. Uh, fragrance. Uh, there are roses that are around that are just so, smell so beautiful. And whenever you pick a rose, you first thing you do is you try to smell it. And it's, it's like a habit. We have no other way. Uh, you, you, you can't almost, you can't help yourself. You want to smell the roses. Disease resistance is a very important factor. And the rose grower will tell you, that, uh, almost all of them, that their rose is disease resistance. Some are and some aren't. And there's a way of finding out which ones are. And I'll explain that. You want to grow roses for the size of the uh, place you're putting in. Some roses grow two feet, others grow 10 feet, some uh, ground covers. So you want to make sure that the rose you're selecting is going to fit the need that you uh, would like. The shape of the rose is important. Some people like the hybrid teas with a pointed center. Others like the English type of uh, uh, many multi petal uh, shape. Those are av uh, available and you, you pick the ones that you like and grow those. Important criteria is the availability. You can go to a big box store and they, they have uh, multiple roses, but most of them are all the same. And sometimes you want a different rose. And where do you find that? Well, you can go uh, to your websites of your local garden shops, Roseland in particular around New Bedford, uh, Redwood Nursery in uh, Swansea here, or Sylvan's or any of your local places. And they will have a different selection and probably a bigger selection than you would find at a Home Depot. But that doesn't mean the Home Depot is a, a bad roses. They just, they have, a, they grow their roses that they think people are going to buy and they, they've planned many years ahead and then we get it through uh, and they grow them in North Carolina and they're all healthy and they're beautiful. But uh, they might not be, uh, the rose you want might not be in that store, but there are ways of finding it. Okay, and this is selection references that I use. Uh, the first, uh, my first selection is always the ARS handbook. That's the American Rose Society handbook. And you can purchase this for about $10 at the, uh, from their website, www.rose.org. It has about 10,000 roses in it listed alphabetically. And this handbook is put together by yearly by uh, the Rosarians that belong to the American Rose Society. We were given a survey and we come out with a nice, uh, uh, you, you fill in the survey and now it's all done electronically, but before it was all hand done. And it's been done for many years. Uh, and we rate the roses and they're rated from a, on a scale of one to 10. And any, a good rose is a seven or an eight. I've never seen a nine and there are no tens. There's no perfect rose, but there are some roses that are better than others. And uh, some roses grow better in New England than others. And that's why uh, I put down Mike and Angie Shoots uh, book. Mike and Angie are friends of mine and I'm kind of prejudiced, but this is one of the better books on how to uh, grow roses. And they have at least a hundred or maybe more roses in there that grow well in Rhode Island and New England. And uh, it, you should take advantage. Do not go on uh, uh, Amazon and try to buy this book because 
uh, for some reason, it's available there, but it's like $120. If you go to their website, www.rosesolutions.net, you can purchase it for around 20. Uh, Help Me Find is a website that is a real boon to all rose growers. It has not only 10,000 roses in it, it has the pictures of 10,000 roses and in multiple pictures. And you can pick out a rose that you really like. If you've seen a rose and you write, you've written it down, you go to this site here and it's pretty self-explanatory how to find them. You type in the name and you get a picture of the rose, you get a zone it uh, grows in and uh, a lot of information. And, it, and it's all from members uh, who people like ourselves who would send in to help me find. You can enter anything you want and you send them pictures and you, you rate the rose. So it's a great, great source and it's available uh, free of charge. Uh, you, there are some criteria for uh, to get other things. Another thing that helped me find as is it has places that sell the roses. So if you have a rose that you can't find it at the local garden shop, uh, uh, go here and it will tell you where you can order it online or how to order it online. But you wanna be sure to plant what you like. This is a picture on the left here of the Ross Jones Duff Rose Garden. And you can see it's very formal. All the roses are pretty much the same size and it's laid out beautifully in, uh, in rows of, uh, asymmetrically. It was, this, this rose garden was designed by Steve Scaniello and it's a really a treasure. And you all should uh, try to take a step down there and, and look at it, it's beautiful. Uh, but I, here on the side here is a climbing rose that I have, Claire Martin, that uh, is good for a structure and it, it's against my garage. And it, uh, it's just a beautiful rose. It flowers all summer and it kind of breaks up the uh, landscape of the house. But, but roses, you can plant in pots, you can plant uh, for ground cover, you can plant them however you want. This is another list and I think uh, you're gonna send, uh, when they sent it out to you, I don't know if it was supposed to, it was supposed to be sent out to you. And this is a list of Rhode Island favorite roses of Rhode Island Rose Society. The Rose Society uh, did this in uh, 2019 and the list was uh, put together by Patsy Cunningham. She went through and she got uh, uh, everybody three, a third, three or four roses that they like. And she made a, uh, a compilation of uh, just what roses. The two with the dark arrows on the left, Canyon Road and Music Box, I grow. And I really recommend them. They, they've outperformed anything that I've ever expected of them. Um, the one with the red arrow is South Africa. And that's uh, a yellow rose that I saw last year at the uh, uh, at a rose show, uh, not actually at a rose show, at a virtual rose show, and it was uh, spectacular. And uh, everybody who has it is raving about it. So that's on my to-do list to get South Africa. <coughs> and a criteria you want to pay attention to is the zone hardiness. And the roses that you buy, almost all of them on the package will have a zone for uh, where it's grow, uh, it, it should be grown. Uh, but this is a little misleading. The zone hardiness is a minimum temperature, average minimum temperature in uh, this, this area. And uh, the area is a, it's a 10 year average. So once in a while you get uh, some, uh, a winters that are colder than that and or uh, warmer than that and it can be fooled uh, especially in New England uh, we get uh, a variation uh, the another thing that the zone doesn't teach us is wind wind is an important factor and in, in the winter time it can desiccate the roses fairly easily so you really uh, have to be careful with that uh, try to protect the uh, roses not only from the cold but from the wind uh, roses have certain requirements that whether you're in a, uh, growing them inorganically or organically, if you're feeding them all the fertilizer in the world, there are certain things that still have to be done. And one is sun. 
you can't grow ro uh, roses in the shade. You, they need a minimum of six hours. If uh, you don't have six hours, I'd advise you to plant some other uh, flower. Uh, there are some roses that do well in six hours and there are lists available uh, of those, but try to get full sun uh, on, on your roses if you can, or at least six, uh, six hours again is the minimum, but try to get more. Water, uh, you, roses need about one inch a week. They are pretty drought tolerant. Uh, even with the massive drought that we had last year, they did fairly well. Uh, they, uh, they came through pretty, uh, pretty good. Uh, I was watering, I have an irrigation system and you wanna uh, have an irrigation system for uh, your roses if you can. Some of my roses uh, are around my uh, vegetable gardens and I use a sprinkler. So, you know, I, you can use water on the leaves, but if you're gonna do it, do it in the morning. So like the, the nighttime temperatures, uh, uh, nighttime humidity is, is tough on roses because that's when the fungus will grow on, on the leaves and so forth. So you really wanna be careful uh, to water, uh, uh, to not water the leaves if you can, if you have to, uh, water the leaves, then do it early in the morning. Uh, when you plant your roses, the uh, most important thing is to, uh, I got something coming up here on my screen. I don't know if clear water, okay. I took care uh, of it, Paul. Okay. Have, uh, when you plant your roses, the first thing you should do is have your soil tested. Uh, it's important that you know what's in the soil before you start. Most of the time, you find that uh, water, uh, the, that you, the soil is, is fine, uh, the topsoil is fine, but once in a while you might find you have something missing or uh, some, some characteristic that really isn't that good. And the way you do that is go to UMass uh, uh, Amherst, has uh, a lab and they'll test it for you for about $25 or so for a sample. Uh, and if you go to this site, they'll tell you how to take the sample uh, that's on the screen there. So if you, if you want to, you can write that down. Roses require the soil or don't require, but they would like a soil that is slightly acidic, a pH of 6.3 to 6.7. Now that's a logarithmic scale. So the difference between 6.3 and 6.7 is uh, significant. And uh, if you're between seven and 6.3, it's even more, it's like uh, 70 times more. So you want to be careful uh, of the acidity level. You, you wanna take note of that and you wanna try to get your soil to 6.3 and 6.7. And there are ways of doing that. Um, <laughs> For new plants, I always uh, mix the topsoil I have uh, that's in the site with a potting soil. You want it, the potting soil adds a bunch of uh, lightness to the soil so that the roots can get to. And uh, for grafted roses, uh, you want to plant it two inches below ground level. The own root roses you want to plant at ground level. Now a grafted rose is, graft, uh, is a rose that's been grafted onto a certain kind of rootstock. The rootstocks are chosen because they're available. I mean, they're resistant to certain diseases of, that can affect roots of roses. And it's, uh, it's a big advantage, especially in certain areas like Southern California in the South. Up here, not so much. Uh, the big advantage of own root roses is that they're able to resist coal a lot better than grafted roses. The graft on a rose is susceptible to cold. So that's why in New England, uh, Southern New England, you would put it two inches. If you were further north, you might put it four or six inches. Uh, and Chicago too, Karen, it's two inches probably. Uh, high in organic matter. I always try to mix a little bit of compost in with my uh, soil when I first uh, planting a rose, not a lot. Another thing I'm gonna mention now is that 
uh, a lot of people put, when they're planting a new rose, will put triple phosphate, uh, which is a, a inorganic uh, compound, uh, contains phosphorus. They'll, and they'll put that at the bottom of the hole. And the reason being that it's going to stay there and the plant will use it as it needs, as it seeds fit. There's nothing wrong with that. It, uh, it works uh, and it, it, the phosphorus will not join in the uh, runoff because it's at the bottom of an eight, uh, 18 inch hole and it, will, it won't come up to the top unless the root grabs it and brings it to the top. The reason we are, uh, that I am, uh, probably all of you are organic, is the soil food web. The soil food web is this concoction that somebody came up with to explain what's going on in the soil. But basically, it's uh, this process, right, that's going on on this first column to the far left. The uh, organic matter that's in the soil is broken down by fungi and by bacteria and by uh, small uh, animals, uh, insects, arthropods, nematodes, protozoa, and they're, they're working on this organic matter that's in the soil. And they uh, then uh, feed, and you can see here, there's uh, a mycorrhizae and fungi and saprophytic fungi that uh, are feeding, and this is a two-way street. They are feeding the roots of the uh, plants. Uh, the plants, uh, are through the miracle of photosynthesis, taking the energy of the sun and converting it into carbon products and other products that we eat, uh, they're converting themselves uh, through photosynthesis. And uh, it's, it's a wonderful miracle. And the plant is also feeding the fungi. The, uh, uh, there is exudate coming out of the roots that is uh, a sugar basically uh, that feed the fungi and the uh, and the fungi are being uh, eaten by the nematodes and the, uh, it, all this is working around and it's a very, very uh, circular pattern that the stuff keeps going round and round. The plants die, they become organic matter. The animals die, they become organic matter. It's fed into the roots and uh, the roots uh, take the minerals that are developed uh, from the fungi and they use it in their photosynthesis. It's, it's a great little system. And that's why we're organic. We're feeding this system and we don't want to upset the fungi. We don't want to upset the bacteria. We want all of these things to keep on working. And it's easy to be, say, I want, I'm not going to use pesticides and uh, fungicides in the vegetable garden because you're ingesting that. But in the rose garden, you know, it, the argument is, well, you know, it doesn't matter. Well, it does. You want your soil to be healthy and uh, you want, uh, you know, you don't, you want it to be sustainable. And this is very sustainable. And when we get to the nitrogen cycle, you'll see, I'll mention why uh, the uh, fertilizer that we use is not sustainable. But this is, this is very sustainable and it's organic and it's healthy. Nothing goes wrong. This is a, a diagram that I found in a book uh, by uh, The Hidden Half of Nature by David Montgomery and Anne Bechtel, uh, Beckley. And she, and they say, they used a, uh, some science from uh, Woods End Lab out in Mount Vernon, Maine. And they have this diagram that they uh, developed that is easy to uh, read. These are on the left where it says none, that's a root system of a tomato without any fertilizer added at all. It's just planted in the soil. There's no compost put on top. And you can see that the roots are, there are multiple roots and there are some fine roots and so forth. Uh, this is a conventional where they added fertilizer, uh, chemical fertilizer on the roots. And you can see that there are fewer roots. The roots are thicker and the, uh, the one with they use compost and manure, you can see that there's multiple roots. And this, I sent a note to uh, William Brinton and asked him to explain that if I could read the, what was written about this. And he said there was no paper published, but he forwarded these pictures to me and I put them up here. And he calls this a, 
lazy plant syndrome. You've got big roots here and all it has is chemical media. On the left is uh, something with uh, composted manure. And you can see the difference uh, just like you can in the diagram previously. Uh, the conventional is, I mean, conventional fertilizer has few roots, uh, multiple, uh, where has a compost that had multiple roots, multiple hair, hairy characteristics. And this just looks so much better. It's, and it's also, uh, it's supposed to be, and the, the, here the science is kind of uh, nebulous because I asked for, um, and I've looked for a picture, uh, science that shows that they are, the, these plants with the compost are more resilient and more stress, uh, able to uh, survive stress. And I, you can't really see it. You know, these roots work fine, as, uh, but uh, the, uh, the picture kind of tells a story that it's, it should be better, uh, but the science has, hasn't been done yet or uh, I couldn't find it. And again, I'm not a scientist uh, per se, uh, but uh, when you're using fertilizer, organic or inorganic, the three main things are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, and that's all very, very uh, important in photosynthesis, all three of those. But there are two of them, phosphorus and potassium, that are very stable in the, in the ground. And uh, what's there doesn't really uh, leave the ground unless you're planting uh, corn or something like that, where you're cutting these huge stalks out down in the fruit and taking it all out. For roses and apples and uh, things where you're not using that much, uh, the phosphorus and potassium that is available in the soil is plenty. Both of those are found in uh, rocks. Potassium is found in uh, uh, silica and clay. And my yard is jam packed with clay. If I go down more than 12 inches, I come into a hard clay layer. And that's a problem for me and I deal with it. But, uh, you know, it's not, our roses really don't need this. And when you get your soil test done, uh, my uh, phosphorus, phosphorus and pro, uh, potassium are always way off above the average, above what you need and necessary. So I don't really, when I'm looking at a fertilizer, uh, look at those because uh, I don't really think my, my roses need it. Uh, roses, I mean, fertilizer comes in liquid and granular form. In the early uh, season, like now, uh, I use liquid, I use uh, liquid fish, but there, I, I use a liquid type of fertilizer because the bacteria and the fungi that are in the soil are there, but not in the zillions and zillions that you find in the warmer weather. Uh, right now, they're, they're waking up and they're multiplying. Remember that uh, the average bacteria uh, divides by uh, fusion and uh, one it's like divides like almost every 20 minutes and one would become a million in 20, 24 hours. Uh, I saw that statistic and it's a, it's a eye opener. Anyway, uh, right now the bacteria are waking up, uh, they're multiplying, uh, but I give them a head, a head start by giving them liquid because it's easily digested. Granular takes a little bit more uh, work and they, they will uh, break it down and be able to uh, feed it to the roots. And we use that mid season when there's uh, plenty of bacteria and fungi in the soil. I also use mid season, I use a lot of compost and a lot of mulch. And then late in the season after say the mid September, I use just mulch. I, won't, I might give a little granular, but probably not. I, I haven't in the last few years. Uh, an interesting thing about uh, liquids, you can feed roses through the leaves, uh, you, uh, but you have to feel a mild uh, type of uh, fertilizer. I use a liquid fish a lot, I've said that, and I will give my roses a, a helping of liquid fish every three or four weeks on the leaves, and the underside of the leaves, the stomata will pick up uh, this uh, fertilizer and it will uh, send it all the way down into the roots 
but uh, there are bacteria that are living inside of the uh, plants, uh, just like there are bacteria that are living inside of uh, humans and uh, animals, and they will uh, develop and, and feed on this uh, type of fertilizer. The nitrogen cycle, and the reason I hop on nitrogen is because, I, again, that's the one, one thing that uh, it does disappear from the soil. Like when a nitrogen uh, is formed the same, uh, same way as the other uh, minerals that are developed or used, uh, but it's caused mostly by uh, decomposing of organic matter that is in the soil. There are certain kinds of bacteria that work on uh, nitrogen products and uh, uh, rabbit uh, droppings and uh, earthworm, uh, earthworm castings. That's a nice word, isn't it? Castings, dropping. Uh, we know what it is. Anyway, uh, it's, uh, it's broken down uh, the remnants of the animals, the remnants of the uh, insects, whatever's in the soil when they, when they die, uh, it's broken down into ammonia and then to nitrates and nitrites and nitrates. But part of it is, a lot of it escapes. It goes back into uh, nitrogen and nitrogen's a gas and it goes into the air. And uh, it, uh, if you really wanna know, the air that we breathe is like 78% nitrogen. So uh, it's a big factor and it, uh, it's tough to bring down, but it, it, most of it just stays in the, in the soil. But uh, some of the nitrogen is uh, brought into the uh, soil by certain kinds of plants, uh, like the legumes and so forth. And then there's lightning uh, up here on the right that would also produce nitrogen. Nitrogen takes a lot of energy to uh, be broken down into ammonia. And that's what happens uh, in the uh, fertilizing plants the uh, Bosch process that uh, developed by the Germans in the uh, turn of the uh, 19th, the uh, 20th century uh, produces ammonia, but it uses a lot of uh, power, a lot of uh, electricity, and it also uses a lot of pressure to produce uh, the ammonia. And, but about half of the world's uh, nitrogen comes from fertilizer that is brought in. Uh, it's a, it's, so, but by being organic, we, you know, don't use that. So we're contributing, it's a, our method, our organic method is much more sustainable than uh, uh, by dropping, uh, by using a lot of uh, organic material. Organic fertilizers that we use, that I use that are high in nitrogen. Uh, first of all, I've talked about liquid fish enough, other than I want to say that uh, the liquid fish that I use is organic gem. Uh, Rick uh, from Ross Jones Duff House put me onto this, and they donate. They're, they're headquartered in New Bedford, so I'm giving them a little plug. Organic gem, you can find it at uh, some uh, stores and just go on the internet, look up organic gem, and it'll tell you who's distributing it in your area. Uh, but it's, it's probably, you know, if you read the literature, it's probably one of the better uh, liquid fishes around. It's a cold process, so there's a lot of uh, material in it, and it's really good. Uh, fish emulsions is a more heat process fish. Uh, and liquid kelp is good. Kelp uh, has the advantage of having all kinds of uh, minerals in it. It has 65 minerals that are, or 68 minerals, I forget what it is, that are necessary for life. And, uh, you know, the sea is one big uh, stew out there. And uh, all of the fertilizer is, uh, I mean, all of your seaweed is uh, loaded with this uh, wonderful fertilizer. Uh, and you can just go to the beach someplace, and uh, we all live along the coast here in southern New England, and find some uh, seaweed, take it home in a couple of garbage bags, put it in the, on your yard, run a lawnmower over it, and uh, uh, dry it out first, and then run it, run, run the lawnmower after you dry it out. And then throw it on top of your uh, mulch that's in the garden. Uh, rose tone is the uh, 
uh, there's alfalfa tea. Now, I don't know if any of you make compost tea and the alfalfa tea is the uh, same thing, only, only different, as my kids say, same thing, only different. It's a, uh, it's, you make it with alfalfa pellets uh, instead of using compost. And the advantage is that you know what goes into it and it's high in nitrogen and you make it uh, similarly. And you can spray it on your, on your plants uh, or you can uh, put it in the soil. Rose Tone is my granular go-to uh, now. Uh, and Mills Magic is, is also a good one. There are plenty of granular uh, organic uh, roses, uh, rose uh, fertilizers and uh, you know, choose the one. Just be careful that there's not uh, any sludge in it. Sludge uh, can come from municipalities where you might find heavy metal. So be careful of that because you don't want to be putting heavy metal in your soil, even though you're not eating it. Uh, <laughs> there, are, there are people that might come after you and uh, you know, wouldn't want to have a lot of uh, heavy metals in their soil. Compost. Uh, most compost is made 60, 40, 60% uh, brown material and 40% green. I go 50-50, uh, uh, about half and half. I, I have a tumbler and that I use to make my compost. It, uh, I put about six barrels of uh, material in it and I get about two uh, barrels of compost. Uh, oh, I should say almost compost at the end. And the, um, the almost compost uh, is great, great for mulch because it's bulkier, it covers more area and uh, I need to uh, cover quite a bit of roses. And uh, the work uh, that it does, it does have a lot of nitrogen in it and because I use a green. I add, uh, before I take my compost out, I add some peat moss. And I, uh, I do that because my soil is a fairly neutral pH. It's around 6.9 this year. Last year it was seven. Uh, and I'm trying to get the soil down uh, without using sulfur. Uh, but uh, there, are, uh, there are methods of doing that. And one is, using the, uh, 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 what was I saying, the, uh, uh, I forget, I just left, I just said it and I just can't remember it right now. And anyway, uh, the peat moss, <laughs> there it is. I, I use the peat moss once in a while and it, uh, it uh, peat moss has a pH of around four. So you get, uh, you get it, uh, it, it, it kind of trying to break my uh, soil pH down. Now there's other things you can use, uh, alfalfa pellets. If you have a rabbit, uh, you can uh, use the alfalfa pellets directly uh, by digging a hole uh, and putting the pellets in the ground. Blood meal is an interesting organic fertilizer because blood meal will give you a lot of iron, uh, if you, especially if you in, uh, need iron in your soil. And sometimes you might. Uh, but it also uh, gives off an odor that is uh, repellent to uh, small uh, animals like rabbits that might uh, be in your garden and uh, chewing on your roses or deer. Uh, for deer, it'll only work for a couple of weeks and deer will get used to the smell and come around. But they think a, a crit has been uh, killed there and is a predator, so they'll stay away. Fish. Fish meal is another good thing. Uh, it's a little pricey. I don't use it. Worm castings are good. If you only have a few, uh, few roses, you can have worm. Uh, you can grow some roses in those worm hotels that they have. I did that for a number of years. It works very well. But when you have 70 roses, you need a whole lot of worms. Uh, so I've kind of I've stopped doing that. Cotton seed meal is. Uh, also a good source of nitrogen. It's very high in nitrogen, you know, six, six, three, one, I think is, it, is the uh, formula on the bag. Uh, but the nice thing about cottonseed meal is it's acidic. And again, I, I'm telling you that I, I need to get my soil uh, more acidic. So uh, I'm switching this year to using cottonseed meal. Uh, it's about the same price as the granular rose uh, fertilizer. So I. Uh, wish me luck. I, I hopefully it'll help uh, get my pH down. 
But the main thing is to use a mulch on your, on your soil, on the tops of your soil. Mulch does a lot of things that are great. It, it's a great for weed control. When I put down my mulch in certain parts of my garden, not too much around the roses, but where I have open space between, I, I, under, underneath my rose, I'll put a uh, newspaper. And but to put the mulch on top of that, and you don't get any weeds. If all you have is, is roses in your garden, uh, a, a weed control, uh, a good, good thing is to put the newspapers underneath. The other things, other reasons for is to water retention. So like that, you don't have to use as much water and adds organic matter to the soil, and very important. The types of mulch, wood chips, leaves, seaweed, and manure, and almost compost, that's what I use. Uh, but wood chips are prev uh, prev uh, predominant in all, many of the uh, large rose uh, gardens, such as at Ross Jones Duff House. Uh, uh, hardwood is, is the best if you can get it. Uh, if not, uh, and you, you can use uh, pine bark or whatever. The reason you want to use wood chips is that it lasts. It lasts, uh, you know, a year or so, uh, maybe even more, uh, depending on how much you have and uh, what kind of wood it is. Uh, but you want your pieces to be about an inch, an inch and a half uh, of wood chips. Leaves are very good. I have a, a arrangement with one of the, the uh, local gardeners here. That he dumps a bunch, all the leaves that he catches, that he picks up in people's yard. He dumps them in the woods not too far from my house. I go over there and I get the leaves in the summer when I need it uh, and put it around my roses. And it's a very good mulch. And also it comes with worms. So it's just very good for my garden. Seaweed I've already mentioned uh, is a great, uh, uh, mulch. Uh, I just put a sprinkling on it because it's, it, you know, it's heavy to carry and you got to go and collect it. But uh, it's, it's, if you have a source of seaweed, use it. Manures, uh, be careful with manures. Make sure it's well aged. The same with the uh, pine bark uh, mulch, if you, uh, but uh, more so with manure than with pine bark. You want it to be aged because manures carry a lot of seeds and you, uh, really be got to be careful you'd be weeding all summer long and, and driving yourself nuts uh, make sure it's aged for at least a year sometimes two or three just to get rid of the weeds uh, that are in it and almost compost that's what i do and i've already alluded to that we're going to move right along here but the soil food web and this is a great picture of a soil food web here you see the the worm and its castings and we know what that is and th this is the uh, mycorrhizae and root uh, uh, plant roots. And you see over here a fungi, uh, some kind of a fungus growing. Uh, it's, it's all in the soil food web. And the soil food web is, the same, is, is in the mulch that we use. And we're feeding the soil food web. And that's, you know, that's how we're doing, uh, that's how we're using uh, that's why I say I'm organic because I'm feeding these guys. It's, you know, like I said, my Galileo moment when you have, uh, you're not feeding the plant. It's not the world revolving uh, around, I mean, the sun revolving around the earth. It's the earth revolving around the sun. And that's what we're doing. We're feeding this soil food, food web. And therefore, we're going to be cognizant. We're going to be trying not to harm the soil food web. And that's the whole thing. And we go and get into the insect control. You can see here some ladybugs and they're good guys. They eat uh, harmful uh, insects that are in the garden, uh, especially the uh, little aphids. And uh, they also eat, eat some other uh, things that are eating your plants. And they're in the garden too. So you, you can't go randomly and use uh, any old insecticide. You want to use what they call in integrated pest management, which just stands for another word, the least harmful method of controlling the insects. And, you know, some of these things are really uh, technically insecticides, but uh, they killed insects. 
but we're, we're, at, we're targeting them. And most of them are organic compounds that we're, we're using. And it, uh, so it's considered organic. And if you had an organic farm and you were making organic food, you could use uh, all of these things. Um, but the biggest uh, insects that uh, palm roses are, are listed here. And uh, mites and aphids are controlled very easily by a water spray. Aphids a lot easier than mites. We, uh, use a gentle uh, spray. We'll get the aphids off your leaves and on the ground, and they don't fly, so they they're going to take them forever to get back up. Mites, you might have to use a little stronger a water, but the, uh, if you do it three or four days in a row, the, the mites will uh, have left your area. Caterpillars and larvae. Here we have gypsy moths, and we used to have winter moths, and for those kind of things. Uh, if you get if we get invaded by a lot of gypsy moths, you want to get rid of them because they'll they'll do the tune on on your roses. Uh, but I use uh, an insecticide called BT, which is a and spinocide, and that's just bacteria. They will go into a, uh, a little crawling uh, caterpillar and they will eat it <laughs> from the inside out. And uh, in a couple of days, the uh, uh, they're dead. Uh, midges are another uh, thing that is also uh, a problem for some insecticides. You won't see these things. Their midges are small, they're a small fly, but they lay their eggs on de uh, developing plants, uh, developing growth in the plants, and it's particularly in the buds. And you'll notice, you'll know you'll have midges when the bud starts to droop. You'll think, oh, I'm going to get a flower in a day, and all of a sudden, there's no flower. It's just a, it's just a bud, and it's hanging down instead of standing up. Well, you've got midges. Uh, most people control this with a systemic insecticides. I uh, try not to. I stay away from insecticide systemics unless I really, really have a big problem, and I have a big midge problem. But spinocide does it. it the way it does is spinocide again. Uh, bacteria. It collects against the uh, uh, it, it, against the little maggots that the uh, flies have. Maggots they don't have, uh, but uh, you know. So that's what it's, it's same thing. It's got a soft covering and uh, is a caterpillar. And a spider side would work. The only problem is the midges have a twenty. I uh, mean a fourteen a fifteen day life cycle, and so you have to spray every couple of weeks with this. So it's a pain. I've been trying to get something else and I have something uh, that I, my son let me, uh, gave me a microscope that one of those little microscopes that you can attach to your camera. And I've um, uh, been working on getting, uh, uh, there's another uh, method. I'm gonna see if it really works or if it can work. Uh, but anyway, uh, spinocide does work. Uh, and uh, uh, Japanese beetles, let's move on. Uh, Japanese beetles, a pain. <laughs> There's no way of getting around it. There's no uh, no good uh, soft insecticide that is going to kill a Japanese beetle that you want to spray around your house or uh, in your gardens. Uh, uh, you know, it, it, they're they're tough little critters. Uh, I hand pick them. I go around in the evenings, and I I'll go back there. I didn't want to get rid of that. Oh. Okay, um, the, uh, I use milky spore uh, in my yard. And that's again, it's a bacteria that uh, infects the grubs that are in your yard, the uh, Japanese beetle grubs that are in your yard. You have to use it, uh, it's pretty expensive, but it does kill the Japanese beetle that's in your yard. The problem is Japanese beetles fly and they uh, come from your neighbors. Uh, so uh, you try to, uh, you know, use, uh, you know, use common sense and uh, just go out and pick these guys off. I use it twice a week. I go out with a little bucket of soapy water and hand pick them and throw them in the thing. Uh, another thing for insect control is uh, plants. A lot of the gardeners uh, in the uh, societies are into uh, plants that uh, they plant companion plants for the roses and they have they plant dill, thyme, and queen's lace uh, are in the garden. Uh, 
I don't, I have dill in the yard, but I'm not in, in my rose garden. I do, cause I eat that, but uh, I use, I do put some garlic in the yard and that repels uh, the smell of the garlic and chives or marigolds are also good plants. And there's a whole big category of plants uh, that will uh, entice or repel. And, uh, you know, uh, I behooves you to uh, look that up and uh, find the ones that you want to grow amongst your roses. And a lot of people do grow a lot of things amongst their roses. But this is the big culprit that uh, bugs all of the people in Southern New England and probably on the whole East Coast and all the way to the Rocky Mountains. For some reason, black spot, which is caused by a fungus is not uh, seen very often or very much in, on the West Coast. But this is its, how it looks, it's ugly. It causes these black spots, it diffuse, and eventually the leaves turn yellow and die. Uh, and it's caused by a fungus, Diplocopum rose, and it needs hot and moist conditions. Uh, we don't really see it here until the middle of June, and it, it's a problem. Uh, and a lot of the literature that you're reading about hardy roses or roses that resist disease, they're talking about black spot. And the way you want to take care of this is to clean, and, re and this is very important, to clean and remove the leaves and affected parts. Uh, there's some uh, gardeners that will go out, rose gardeners that will go out and remove the lower limbs uh, on their rose bushes. They just take them right off because it comes from the soil. Uh, the fungus comes from the soil and the rain. It's sprayed up on the, on the leaves and it just kind of migrates up the, up the rose bush. Uh, so they, they uh, limit it by cutting the leaves off even when they're healthy off the bottom. I wait for it to come. And I always start by using baking soda. Baking soda is, a, it's a fungicide, but you, you gotta remember just like the baking soda that you put in your refrigerator, it goes stale fast. It, after about a month, it's not very uh, useful. So you gotta buy a box, every uh, one of those little boxes every, every month and uh, use it. And I wasn't doing that. And I just thought my baking soda wasn't, you know, the the fungus had gotten resistant to the bacon soda. Not the case, it's just the bacon soda was, uh, and it was no longer effective. I also spray my roses with the, uh, when I'm spraying with the uh, uh, liquid fish, I will put a bacteria, uh, uh, there's some helpful uh, bacteria that you can buy. I use uh, AG1, uh, it, but it's uh, the same as t uh, taking, uh, um, uh, eating food with a lot of bacteria. It just uh, increases the amount of bacteria, the competition for the, uh, the food on the leaf and uh, that the bacteria are after the dead, the dead food and uh, the helpful bacteria are just competing against the fungus. So you get less fungus. Sulfur sprays are permissible. Uh, they were pretty much uh, organic and uh, there's some light uh, earth. Dr. Earth has some sulfur sprays that are very light uh, and it's okay for organic gardening. I use the sulfur spray in late fall and early spring. And again, I'm spraying the leaves. I'm not spraying the soil where the soil food web is. I'm spraying the leaves. I know so it's gonna get down on the, on the soil, but in minimal amounts and just on the surface. And it, it's not a real uh, problem with the amounts that I'm giving is that we're not destroying the, the uh, good uh, fungus. I, again, this, the, I went, uh, uh, the, uh, I skipped a page there, but it, uh, I skipped over something on that page. The last one here is a new thing for me. I started it last year. It's phosphite. It's a fungicide, it's a fungicide but it's phosphate, uh, it's, it's phosphorus. And, uh, but for some reason, the funguses uh, can't eat it. They can't uh, digest it. They, do, and they think they have, they know there's phosphorus inside of phosphite. It's uh, just uh, one less oxygen molecule, one more hydrogen uh, than a phosphate. But for some reason, the, the fungus is just, uh, Un, unable to eat it, and they, they know it's there, and they try it. At least this is the explanation I I get from the literature, and uh, it uh, 
you know, they starve, you know, because they don't have phosphorus. And the other thing that phosphite does is it causes the cell walls on the leaf to thicken. And I don't know why it does, uh, it does but it does. So the leaf becomes more resistant, becomes tougher, and uh, the fungus uh, is, is eliminated. Uh, and the, uh, but it, it's a wonderful thing. There was an article I found in uh, the American Rose magazine written by uh, someone uh, who said that uh, black spot has been eliminated in the United Kingdom. Now, I can't believe that because the United Kingdom is, 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 if anything, it has a lot of moisture in the summer. Uh, but uh, phosphite apparently worked for them. I used it last summer uh, and I got good results. I mean, I had less black spot than normal. Uh, but I still got some black spots. So I'm going to uh, stick with phosphite as a spray. Uh, you can't use it uh, for uh, certain when the temperature is too hot, but it works well. And these are the two phosphite uh, products available in the United States today in small quantities. Uh, Monterey, Garden, Foss, and Reliant. And they're, they're the same. Uh, you know, you can get them on Amazon or you, in some of the garden stores now. Uh, it says a systemic fungicide. We're not putting it uh, on the roots. I, I don't use it on the roots as a systemic. I'm using it on the leaves. I, I know it's going to get down onto the soil, but it'll be uh, very small amounts. I mean, when I spray a, a rose bush, I probably put like uh, three or four ounces on uh, of liquid. And uh, um, you mix this at a... Uh, a taste uh, one ounce per gallon. So I don't know the uh, amount of uh, phosphorus that's going to end up on the ground is very minimal and I'm not worried about it. Uh, but it is, a, a, they do use it on roots uh, uh, to, in the soil in some countries, uh, and, but they use a lot bigger quantities than you see here. All right, now we're coming to what's going on right now outside in the gardens and that's uh, trimming or uh, pruning. Um, I'm not going to go into that too much because uh, the uh, it's more of an art than a science. Uh, but use shop tools and uh, find a video that shows how to prune and follow it. Uh, the uh, deadheading is another thing on the bottom here. I, it's kind of pruning when you, uh, but you should do it. The the I mean pruning. You should do pruning. Uh, and you can't make any mistakes. The worst thing you can do is to do nothing. If you have roses, you should be doing some pruning. Uh, don't be scared of it. Just go ahead out there and cut some things. And whatever you're doing is better than doing nothing. Uh, dead, uh, but look for a video, find a good video and follow the directions. It's pretty uh, basic. Uh, the, the four points that uh, I've listed here are uh, what, what they'll tell you to do and they'll show you how to do it. So you, you'll feel more confident. Deadheading is you go out and you cut the uh, flowers off after they've bloomed. And you cut down to a, uh, the, you cut the, uh, down to a five leaf stem. And um, you should do that. And you'll get more blooms if you deadhead. Fertilizing is important, uh, but you should stop fertilizing in September. Uh, around here, uh, you want to you let the plant rest. Uh, it's going to go into a dormant period when it, uh, after a significant frost, and you want you don't want any new growth. Uh, you don't want the the plant expanding energy. Once uh, you should also stop deadheading at that point too, because the uh, rose bud uh, turns into a fruit, and the fruit will tell the plant to slow down, it, uh, not to produce any you know, not to produce anything else. It's got, it's got the fruit is made. Uh, the, uh, and uh, so you just keep on, uh, you do not want to, you know, keep the plant growing right until it gets hit by the frost. You want it to start to slow down. Uh, in the winter time, you want to protect your roses somewhat. This is on the left here is a uh, David Long, who is the district governor for uh, New England the Rose Society, it's, it's his garden, and he just mounds up manure uh, around his roses. He puts about seven or eight inches of uh, uh, compost, uh, aged manure 
uh, and you can see how well aged this is. He puts this up around the plants for his winter. I use uh, leaves, uh, mostly I, you can't see here because there's snow on the right. Uh, I use just, I'll put chopped leaves up around the roses. And uh, I also use uh, for my hybrid teas, I'll put a big uh, a web, uh, a chicken wire cage around it and put about a foot of uh, chopped leaves around my roses, around my hybrid teas. And I have a one rose that is a zone seven and I've kept it alive for about 10 or 15 years now. Uh, it's a beautiful rose called Fame and uh, I just love it, but uh, it's a toughie to grow around here. And it, it really took a beating this winter because of the wind that we had here. Uh, and the next thing I'm going to tell you to do is to uh, join a Rose Society. This picture on the left here is a Rose show put on by the different societies. There are four in New England, uh, one in Connecticut, one in Rhode Island, uh, one on the Cape, and one in central Massachusetts. Uh, and they're all in what we call the Yankee District. Uh, there used to be like six or seven, but the ones in Maine and New Hampshire petered out, I understand. Uh, that was before my time. But uh, this is the address of uh, how to join, uh, where you can join the uh, Rhode Island Rose Society and the Cape Cod Rose Society. Uh, you can also look it up on the American Rose Society website, which is at rose.org. Uh, but the Rose Societies are a wonderful place to learn a lot about roses. And when you go to a rose show, and uh, unfortunately, we haven't had a rose show last year, and we're not going to have one in New England this year uh, the, because of COVID. But uh, when you walk into a rose show and you see three to 400 uh, roses all laid out, and the smell, the scent is heavenly, just absolutely heavenly. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. And I leave you all with a picture of the Ross Jones Duff Rose Garden, uh, again, designed by Steve Scaniel, uh, world famous uh, rose grower from uh, New York City. He's head of the botanical gardens in New York and uh, uh, the rose section of the botanical garden. And uh, Steve is a wonderful lecturer and uh, I've heard him a couple of times. And this rose garden is well worth a visit by all of you. Uh, anytime you uh, get there, uh, starting in June through uh, October, you'll see some multiple blooms. This garden is, is a wonderful tribute to uh, uh, Rick Finneran and uh, the people at the, the Ross Jones Duff House to have such a beautiful thing in the middle of the city. It's gorgeous. So uh, I thank you. And if you have any questions, I'll be clear. I'm glad to answer them. Uh, but that's pretty much the, as much as I, you know, can tell you in a uh, time I wanted to keep this uh, to about uh, an hour or so. And uh, thank you very much, Paul. I am going to. Uh, that was great, though. I, tons of information. I think everyone's probably now glad that this was recorded so you can go back and watch any of it. So um, thank you, Paul. I am going to um, just kind of pause the recording.